So, uh, I guess, uh, well, I'll, I'll take it up to an informal vote. Do you want to hear the analog delay, or do you want to hear what goes into an analog delay? <laughs> Let's hear it, yeah. So, um, a delay is, uh, there are many ways to, to, do, uh, to do echo. Um, the very first delays were tape units. Um, you record your part on a tape, and you play it back some time later. Um, and we sort of realized that, uh, you know, tapes have motors in them, tapes wear out, you have to replace them, not roadworthy. So people wanted to come up with uh, chips that did the same thing. And we, uh, they developed a chip called the Bucket Brigade chip, um, which is used in all sorts of things. Like, it's not just an audio, but in uh, timing for old camera flashes and, uh, and stuff like that. And the idea is that it will take a sample of your signal, and it'll pass it down the line um, of buckets, um, sort of like an old school fire brigade, until the end your signal comes back out. Um, and it has a very lo-fi sound, but in a way that's perfect for guitar, because guitar is all about mid-range frequencies. Um, so let's see what we're... Turn this up a little bit. So this is, this is the, um, the Model FVT being used as a preamp. Um, and uh, you can use the EQ and the gain controls of this amp. If you're playing an amp that's got two inputs and you tie them together, um, the, the Model T has that where you can, uh, there's your normal and your bright channel. Um, the normal channel is sort of dark sounding. Um, and then you can use the bright channel to mix in some double presence. So that's our, that's our sort of cleanish tone there. Um, and then this is the analog delay. I'm gonna set this uh, for as clean, about as clean as it gets. style saturation. Let's see if I can dial this in. Within there's so there um, 
I'll, uh, and again, I'll draw this on the board, but there's a, the preamp is adding its own gear, <coughs> and then um, when the, the, the delay is in parallel with the dry path, and then when those are mixed together, a bit more distortion is introduced by that stage. Though significantly less. Um, <laughs> This will oscillate too. Well, I don't want to blow these far away, so I'm going to not do that. So that's sort of that uh, that analog delay sound. Um, there's also there's tap tempo, so you can go from a, a fast sort of, you know, and then you can tap out a rhythm. It, you know, a, a lot more uh, you know, performance worthy. It's a, a circuit where you can uh, tap in the tempo with your foot. Um, and this is also this requires digital control of an analog delay, which is interesting because um, you know you have this. If you can program something to control your circuit, and you suddenly have a lot more uh, range of control, um, a lot of abilities which are otherwise not possible. Uh, so that's sort of just a quick demo of this. I'll let you guys. Uh, in fact, I would love for you guys to come up and try this uh, when I'm done talking. Um, but for now, I'm going to go into a little bit of uh, what makes an analog delay work. Um, so, in an analog delay, your fundamental thing is there. Uh, can we get some light up here, possibly? Unfortunately, there... not. The only lights that we have are those. This one we can bring close. All right. Well, if anyone can't see, let me know, and I'll just try to draw bigger. Um, so, the fundamental um, part of a, uh, an analog delay is this thing we call the bucket brigade chip. Um, and a bucket brigade chip, uh, for the sake of simplicity, has a bunch of stages which sort of feed into the next one. Um, and without drawing the transistors and such, uh, each one of these stages uh, has within it a capacitor. And without going too far into the electrical theory, what I can tell you is that a capacitor is a thing that you can charge up with a voltage. Um, and if you charge up a voltage, it's going to just sit there some amount of time until, you're, until it's able to discharge. These blocks right here are a switch. So uh, is, this, is this too small? Because we need to draw this bigger. Cool. So in each one of these blocks, uh, you have a switch, which is going to say, tell the capacitor if it can charge or discharge. Each one of these switches is then sort of uh, clocked out uh, and sort of this alternating thing. So what's happening uh, in this very simplified schematic is the clock pulse here turns on, this turns on, these switches open, um, and then, or these switches close, I guess, and then the signal gets passed to this capacitor. This clock gets turned on, the other one gets turned off, and the signal goes from the capacitor to the next one in the line. And so every time you turn the clock on and off, uh, the clock is something that looks a little bit like this, it's a square wave. Um, that clock is switching this on and off, and then the signal is going to hop from bucket to bucket. Um, and this says a few things. Uh, this says that the speed of your clock is going to determine um, how long it takes to go through. Because if you're opening and closing the clock in a very, for, you know, very slowly, then it would stand the reason that a sample is going to take a long time to pass through this. But also, it tells you that the uh, size of your sample is determined by the clock. So if your clock is slow, and let's say you've got uh, a guitar signal that's coming in over here, well, we'll just call it a pure sine wave for the sake of argument. Um, we, want this, we want to be able to sample, you know, like a reasonable amount of this signal in order to, uh, in order to get through the rest of it. Um, there is a theorem called Nyquist Sampling Theorem, which says that if you can get three points on any waveform, uh, you are able to reproduce that waveform, yes? Uh, so I'm just curious, what kind of clock speed are you running the chip at? Um, so that depends on the number of stages that you have, and it also depends on um, the kind of fidelity that you want, of course. Um, the typical rule of thumb is that uh, for uh, 1024 stage BBD, you need about a uh, 10 kilohertz clock to get, like, 300 milliseconds of delay time or something like that. I don't, the formula, I have it written down somewhere. Um, but as you, um, you know, as your clock or your delay time goes longer, you have a lower ability to sample, which means that you need more stages to get more time um, when your fidelity goes away. 
What this also means is that you have to filter going in and out because this sampling device does not want to see information that is higher than uh, three times the rate at which it's sampling. Otherwise, you get weird artifacts. To some extent, that sounds really cool. Um, have any of you guys ever used uh, bit reduction as an audio effect? That's what's happening. Um, there's all sorts of interesting fold over effects and you get frequencies which were not in the original signal. Um, that's great for audio purposes, but if you want a delay that's kind of clean sounding and reproduces a guitar signal, you do want to avoid that in the normal range. Um, I do have the firmware on this one miscalibrated so that you can go beyond the range of, of accurate sampling and hear what that sounds like because I think it's a cool educational tool and I think it's cool for people who want to use that. But for normal settings, you won't hear it. Um, so in all this, you have your sampling, you have your clock. Um, this clock in um, a normal delay pedal is coming from a logic IC which is fed back on itself and it's just going to spit out a square wave at some frequency. And then you, you connect that to a potentiometer uh, or a knob and you get, your, uh, you get your delay time control. For me, this is actually coming from a microcontroller. Um, so the, this is all just gonna be going to uh, a chip called an AT Tiny 85. And you can program the AT Tiny 85 or any of its uh, siblings uh, using the Arduino coding environment. Can people see down there? Uh, are the monitors in the way? Okay. Um, so that is taking, this guy is taking the, uh, the tap input and then turning it, and then it, it uses that information to produce a clock at some frequency that lets the bucket brigade chips uh, do their job. Um, that's, the, that's what's at the heart of this whole thing. But of course, we got to get a guitar signal in and out of it in a way that's going to sound good. So uh, I'm going to erase. Actually, I'm just going to reproduce this drawing over here. So yeah, so this is this is that wave that we're trying to sample. So rule of thumb is three points, roughly, um, and that's called that's Nyquist theorem. If you want to look that up, N Y Q U I S T. Um, so in this delay pedal, um, the first thing that we see is the preamp. Um, and this is going to have a, uh, a gain control attached to it. Now, I was saying before, I really wanted to delay that would distort nicely. So when choosing a preamp, um, there are a lot of ways to do that. You can have a simple clean amplifier. Um, you can have a tube stage. You can have, I mean, you can stick a fuzz pedal in there and it would sound cool. Um, if you have something that is high fidelity, it's going to reproduce as many frequencies as possible, and you distort it, you're going to get high frequency hash. You're going to get a lot of really nasty artifacts. Um, you know, when you distort a signal, it produces higher frequencies, um, which is why any distortion pedal for guitar is going to have a low-pass filter somewhere in there. Um, if you ever play like a Proco Rat, that filter control is a low-pass filter. Um, that chip also, that just that pedal also has the advantage of using a chip which is very bad at reproducing high frequencies, and therefore distorts in an even more pleasing manner, and just gives you a ton of mid-range. So this pre, uh, this preamp is very crucial. Um, and what I ended up going with for the design, without, without going too deep into it, is something that takes uh, an incoming waveform and gives you asymmetrical distortion. So uh, the top is going to get kind of uh, cut off and then the bottom is less so. That's a terrible drawing. But uh, a little bit of asymmetrical clipping, which is not unlike how a tube is going to distort. So tubes are pretty linear um, at low gain. What you get out is more or less what you get in. But as you turn it up, half the waveform is going to start getting altered. And as that, as that waveform is altered, you get distortion. Um, and if it's very smoothly altered, uh, then it's pleasing distortion. That's the, the functional description without going into the Fourier analysis. Um, but suffice to say, I tried to make this sound as nice as possible. Um, so when you turn it up, it's just a little bit crunchy. Now, um, this is going to go straight through uh, to the uh, mix control which is then going to go to the actual mixer. But we already knew that, right? There's a dry signal coming through, but the interesting stuff's going to be happening down this way. Um, so before uh, you go into a medium like a, a bucket brigade chip, um, not only do you have to have some sort of filtering, um, which is the next thing that's here. So this is going to be a uh, low pass filter. Um, you also have to uh, compress the signal going in. The reason being that a guitar, the dynamic range of a guitar signal is like 60 dB easily, depending on how good your right hand technique is. Um, 
And the dynamic range that's, that's uh, inside a bucket brigade ship is like 30 or 40 dB. It's really not that good. Um, so we also, uh, after this filter, we have, uh, or before, depending on your specific design, um, you have a compressor. Um, so the, oops, cough. Um, it's that compressor uh, is just going to be reducing your dynamic range going into the delay line. Now what's funny is that when I first, uh, when I was first coming up with this, I was like, every single delay has a comp hander in it. But the comp hander is what makes an analog delay sound like an analog delay. Um, when you play like a deluxe memory man or a carbon copy or any of those, those analog delay designs, there's like a, you hear pumping on the repeats, and I didn't want that at all. Um, and so I was talking to somebody who had, who, was, who was sort of mentored me in the past, and I was like, is there any way to get away without using a comp hander? And he was like, go buy uh, or, or try one of the earliest memory man delays, and you tell me. And I played it. Um, I have a friend who, who has one, and it sounds like crap. It's really not good. It's a hissy mess. It does, it, the, the delays uh, distort in a really ugly way. Um, and it's just not a nice sounding thing. And a big part of that is the comp hanger. So if you're, you know, your dynamic range, like your guitar dynamic range is sort of, you know, all this. And the highs sort of go down a bit. This range is here. And then you want your quiet stuff to sort of get compressed as much as possible um, in going into this lossy channel, as it's called. You often see comp hander chips, um, the spoiler alert, there's an expander on the other side. Um, used in lossy media like a telephone line, um, cassette tapes, um, and BBDs, as it turns out. So we have the delay, and then we do the opposite of this on the output. Um, so I'm already running out of space here, but we have uh, the expander, and then we've got another low pass filter. And that gets rid of the clock noise, right? So when you're going in, you don't want to sample information that's not there. When you're coming out, uh, this clock signal bleeds into the original signal. And so you want to, you want to get rid of that. Um, it just so happens that your sampling and your clock frequency are the same, so these filters can look the same. Um, and then that output goes to the mixer um, and then back to the output. And so the, um, when I was, you know, after, after I realized that you have to use a comp hander, in a delay design where it's not going to work for noise reasons. Um, there was a lot of back and forth over which ones were actually going to be useful. Um, and it turns out that there, is some, there are more, the classic comp hander chip, so the compressor and expander used in most delay designs, uh, has one fixed attack and release time. Uh, traditionally for this you want a very fast attack and a slow release, um, but you have to sort of go in the middle of both uh, if you only have one time to choose. And so that's why those repeats are going to audibly pump when you're when they're being played back. Whereas in this system, um, I chose a chip which allows you to have a very quick attack and a very slow release. And that once I realized that chip was available, it was it was just it was a revelation because uh, this problem that I had been having of trying to sound like you know like no other delay in the market, or at least trying to you know not sound like any other analog delay on the market. Um, was solved by being able to control those uh, on their own. Um, and that's a, a really good example of, you know, I'm not an expert in uh, telecom, I'm not an expert in cassette tapes, um, but just by sort of beating my head against the wall, the, the wall for a long time, I was able to find uh, this particular chip that sort of uh, met the needs uh, that it needed to. And so that's the, whole, that's the whole block diagram right there. And if you look at uh, a similar analog delay like the Boss DM2, the same block diagram. It's fundamental to anything. Um, all the extra stuff is in how you control it and how you modulate it in that preamp, which is like half the circuit board on mine. Um, but it's just one block of the block diagram. Um, you know, there's just a million ways, uh, a million ways to do that. And so that was sort of the the challenge. There was you know how to make all those work together. And then there's a lot of uh, concerns on the prototyping side, like how do you make sure that the digital clock isn't bleeding into the analog circuitry anymore. Um, how do you make sure that the power supply is nice and clean? Because uh, the delay line is going to run at one voltage, the microcontroller is going to run at another voltage, and the mic preamp runs at a third voltage. So how do you get them not uh, talking to one another? How do you make sure that you can have a switching power supply that doesn't bleed all over the place? Um, and so that was why this thing took me like 18 months to do, because the concept was there, uh, but the noise floor was not. Um, but it's, uh, it's starting to get there. So. Um, so we have this prototype and, you know, we're, uh, if you guys want to keep on messing around with it, 
uh, I, I'd love for that. And if you want me to talk about some of the other pedals there, um, we've got a couple other designs which have been out for a little bit. So that's all the, all the stuff.